The Abominable Snowman, one of the most famous mythical creatures of the snowy biomes. Before we break it down, let's see what the 5th edition entry in the Monster Manual says about it. The entry in the Monster Manual is actually really good. It covers a lot of lore and gives us a lot of flavor for the creature. In fact, it is actually quite interesting how much we got. It's quite rare to see 7 paragraphs dedicated to a single creature. When it comes to snowy and icy biomes, the yetis are kind of a big deal. There's a lot in here, so we're gonna have to skim for the important stuff. It says, a yeti's windborne howl sounds out across remote mountains, striking fear into the hearts of the scattered miners and herders that dwell there. These hulking creatures stalk all pine peaks in a ceaseless hunt for food. Their snow-white fur lets them move like ghosts against a frozen landscape. A yeti's icy simian eyes can freeze its prey in place. Further down it says that the yetis can smell living flesh from miles away. Continuing down it says that even in a blizzard, the scent of its quarry draws the yeti through the cold and snow. That's very impressive. Then it says that multiple different families of yetis can catch the same scent. When that happens, you get territorial fights between them. The winner gets to eat the spoils, including the defeated yetis. So they have no qualms about even eating their own species. Before an avalanche, a blizzard, or a deadly frost, the yeti's howls sweep down the mountain slopes on the icy wind. Some people of the Alpine Peaks believe that the voices of loved ones killed in avalanches and blizzards sound out in the wails of the yetis, crying warnings of ill omen. Down here it tells us that, generally speaking, yetis don't attack settlements if there is an abundance of food in the mountains, but when the yetis go hungry, they will. Devious mountain folk sometimes use the yetis as unwitting weapons. A warlord might lay down slaughtered sheep or goat to draw yetis into an enemy's camp, sowing chaos and thinning the ranks before battle. Mountain clan chiefs might also overhunt to diminish the food sources, so as to force yetis to attack settlements they wish to conquer. Lastly, down here we get an entry into the Abominable Yetis, a larger form than the normal one, standing three times as tall as a human. They typically hunt alone, though you might see a pair that live together just enough to raise young. They are savage and territorial, but that's basically all the description that we get. Now we get a stat sheet for the normal Yeti. We can see that they got strong claws, so an ability to climb does not come as a surprise, but what does is how fast they are. The entry does doesn't really explain why they are so fast. We can also see here that they're very strong, they're very durable, and their intelligence is actually quite high for a monstrous beast. Very wise too, which is cool. Their perception is high, though we're not really told how they can see so well in the snow. Uh, their stealth is great, which makes sense considering that their fur is white, so they have the camouflage ability, so it makes sense. Their dark vision, on the other hand, is not really explained, but we do have what appears to be a form of magical eyesight based on their chilling gaze ability, so maybe that's part of it. Down here, we see that they're afraid of fire. We don't really need an explanation for that. It would make sense for a creature of snow to be afraid of fire, though there actually is an explanation to which we will cover in a little bit. Lastly, we got here is the chilling gaze, which is very interesting. The, the creature otherwise looks pretty mundane, but this here speaks of magic. The Yeti can, using its eyesight, paralyze a person and deal cold damage. It doesn't really explain how it works or how it's supposed to look, but it is very powerful. The abominable Yeti form here is basically the same, except just considerably stronger. The main difference is just the added ability to breathe a cone of frigid air that deals massive cold damage. That's almost as much damage as an adult white dragon's breath. Very strong, but that's it. That's the Yeti entry in the 5th edition Monster Manual. So now let's go ahead and see what the Monster Manual does not tell you about this creature. The first thing that I do want to cover is the actual description of the creature. I know that I blabber around a lot about not having descriptions for the creatures, but it really is important. Because we don't get a description of the creature in 5th edition, many people don't actually know that they actually walk around in all fours. They can stand in two legs, and they do so often, especially in battle, but most of the time they actually walk around like gorillas. That's because they kind of are. Quote, 
An adult Yeti stands 8 feet tall and is covered in long white fur. Their feet and hands are wide and flat, which help to disperse their great weight on treacherous snow fields. They travel on all fours like the apes, but fight very comfortable standing erect. Unlike most apes and gorillas, the Yeti does not have an opposable toe on its feet. They wear no clothing or ornamentation. The spore or smell of a Yeti is very subtle in cold climates, but in confined or warm areas, they have a strong musky odor. The eyes of the Yeti are icy blue or almost colorless. Their claws and flesh are ivory white. Unlike many arctic creatures, the Yeti does not have a thick layer of body fat to keep it warm. Instead, it relies upon the special properties of its thick, warm fur. It has a transparent second eyelid which allows the creature to see in blowing snow and prevents its eyes from freezing in extreme temperatures." End quote. The reason the creature is so fast, boasting 40 speed of movement, is because it can run on all fours. And the reason it can see so well even in the snow is because it has a transparent second eyelid that protects its eyes from snow and general debris. That's why descriptions are very important. If you don't get descriptions, then you don't know why this creature gets so many of these abilities that it has. Now, yetis in Dungeons and Dragons are distant relatives of apes and bears, specifically gorillas and carnivorous apes. If you actually look at the official art for the second edition of Dungeons and Dragons, you will see what the original idea for the creature was. Though this particular yeti does not possess the typical level of fur that the creature would normally possess, this here rendition of the yeti in first edition does show it. So you can still see that it is supposed to be an ape but with a lot of fur. Third edition has a more clear idea for this concept. The fifth edition art showing horns is more of a burrowed attribute from the fourth edition art of the yeti. It is actually very very rare for fifth edition to borrow art and lore from fourth edition so this is actually quite unique. 4th edition was just really, really weird. They generally made up their own lore or changed things up for no reason. It's like they were purposefully trying to invent a new form of Dungeons and & Dragons and erase what it was. You typically see 5th edition resume where 3rd edition left off, but this is just one of those interesting exceptions where the art picked up after the 4th edition rendition. In the lore, yetis don't actually have horns, so I have no lore to give you on them. Now, yetis have two things that make them special and interesting, their fur and their eyes, but let's cover the latter first. The coat of the yeti is powerful and interesting for many, many reasons, but one of the reasons is that it allows the yeti to perfectly camouflage in the snow. The monster manual didn't tell you, but during heavy snow or during any kind of icy storm, the yeti is actually meant to be completely invisible unless it is very, very close to you. They don't really have to do anything to get this benefit either, their coat just perfectly camouflages them with the snow and if it is generally hard to see, like in a blizzard, you will simply not see the yeti until it is right in front of you. And this is why the preferred way of attacking for yetis is to ambush. Because yetis are so good at smelling their prey in spite of the conditions, they will go ahead of their prey and dig themselves down under a thin layer of snow. So when the prey eventually finds its way over, they will jump out of the snow and surprise them. This tactic is really important to them, that's because their gaze ability actually used to only work when they had a surprise round. So ambushes to them were crucial. Outside of allowing for a perfect camouflage, their fur was special in that it absorbed heat extraordinarily well, keeping the Yeti warm while simultaneously dealing cold damage to enemies. See, the coat of fur had the supernatural ability of absorbing so much heat from its surroundings that all around it would be devoid of any heat whatsoever. If you touch the fur of a living yeti, you could literally die of cold. The heat of your body would be absorbed by the fur. This is why a yeti's favorite way of killing humans and other prey was to crush them to death by hugging them and smothering them in their fur. This ability, however, was a double-edged sword. On the plus side, it kept the yeti warm regardless of how cold it got, which granted it immunity to cold damage. But on the negative side, it gave them a weakness to fire. See, if a yeti absorbed too much heat from its surroundings by the fur, the creature could actually develop a fever. This could happen if they, say, attacked an adventuring camp with a strong enough pit fire, or if they were attacked by multiple fire attacks, or if they simply crushed too many living beings with their body and absorbed too much of their body heat. 
If this happened, they would start to feel feverish and their metabolism would slow down. If this continued, they would eventually pass out and even die if it continued long enough. A Yeti had to keep their body temperature very low in order to survive. Now this supernatural ability of its code would eventually vanish when the creature died. Quote, this cold radiation faded away gradually after a Yeti dies. The internal biological and chemical functions which maintained such an extremely low body temperature eventually ceased within a dead Yeti, and the body then began to approach the temperature of its surroundings, thus decreasing the effect of the radiation of cold." End quote. This means that if you waited long enough, you could safely skin the coat of the Yeti and maybe even use it for yourself. The fur of the Yeti is its most valuable treasure, and it is extremely good at keeping you warm through even the coldest of temperatures. The coat is so good, in fact, that it is worth around 300 gold pieces in the open market. Regardless, Yetis know of their weakness and their propensity to sickness if they get too hot, and this is why they have an aversion to fire and maybe even fear of it. But now, onto the eyes. Quote, Additionally, they have a special talent for inducing great fright in their opponents. More than a few have survived Yeti encounters have testified to an unnatural sense of horror upon gazing into a snowman's pale eyes. The majority agreed to the description of it as a mind-chilling sensation, leaving the blood as water and the skeleton as jelly, though not everyone is affected in exactly the same manner. The most experienced of fighting men seem to have some resistance to this power, however. This effect does not take place against creatures which are normally immune to fear of any sort, including cavaliers, most undead, and generally mindless creatures. It is believed that the unusual crystalline coloring, together with a strange and faint pulsating of light within the creature's eyes, is responsible for this effect. Such pulses die when the Yeti does, thus ending any more fear-striking gazes from the creature." End quote. Based on the description given, not just on this quote, but also based on the 5th edition entry, we can see that there does appear to be some strange magic at play. This ability combined with the supernatural effects of the fur explain why the creature is a monstrosity and not a beast, since clearly there's some magical modifications here done on the creature. Even though the creature is basically just a winter carnivorous ape, there is certainly more to it than that. I should say though, because the magic of the eye dwindles out and expires after the Yeti dies, there doesn't appear to be any real value in the market for the eyes. Unfortunately. Now something that you will find interesting is, I, I found this quote in, on Dragon Magazine number 127 under page 57. It says, quote, The physical strength of the average Yeti is comparable to that of a hill giant which is greater than that of any human alive." End quote. That is insane. But now that we're basically done talking about abilities and powers, let's talk about habits and ecology. What do these creatures do? Even though the Yeti is of basically average intelligence, they have no civilization. They do have the ability to wield and use simple tools, but they will never create them themselves. If they find a weapon, they can use it and you would see them use it but they will never craft one themselves. The most common weapon that you will see them use are actually rocks, which they are quite adept at throwing. Now, they live in ice caves in hills and mountains, and most of their caves tend to be natural, but sometimes the Yetis will excavate them themselves, especially if they need to accommodate a very large family. This is when you might see them using tools in order to dig themselves the largest of caves. Now, Yetis are very defensive of their families. In fact, they will literally eat anything that is alive except for a family member. Though their favorite diet consists of herd creatures such as caribou, they can also be seen eating a lot of bears and wolves. It is believed though that human flesh is their favorite, though no surprises there. In any case, as much as they will devour anything, the one exception is the family. Life is rough in the Arctic. Friends and food are very difficult to find. And because of this, Yetis have evolved to care about survival and reproduction the most. Males typically have one to three females with them, and they will generally stick together and hunt together. If you see a group of Yeti, the biggest one will always be the male of the group. Quote, Yeti are actually biological relatives of both the lower primates and the bears. They are most closely related to the mountain gorilla, to which of the Yeti's typical habits and instincts might be compared. Yeti mate and bear young much as do the other lower primates. After that, the young stay with the parents for only two years after birth. 
they don't stay dependent on their parents as long as do most other primates. Any young encountered with a group of yeti will typically be just old enough to fight effectively on their own. This early separation and independence from the parents causes them to hunt for food at a relatively early age, limits their population growth to those strong enough to survive, and accounts for part of their racial ferocity." End quote. Because the babies leave so early, many of them end up simply dying. This actually helps keep the population low in the area so that it is easier for those strong enough to actually find food. Now, even though baby yetis leave the family after two years of age, the yeti is actually considered an adult after it has reached five years of age. The power to frighten opponents using their eyes, their gaze ability, comes at around this time. Now, what's really interesting, and this is something that you probably didn't see coming, certainly not something that the Monster Manual will tell you, is that because yetis have such an instinctual care for their families, and it is the one thing in the whole wide world that they would never hurt or eat, if you were to somehow find a baby yeti, you could actually raise it effectively and domesticate it. Yeah, I bet you weren't expecting that one. If you capture a yeti at an early age and you care for it appropriately by giving it ample food and keeping it in an arctic climate, you could tame it and raise it just how you would any normal animal. For the first two years of doing this, they would be lovely. But then, after they reach around their second year of age, their instincts would start telling them that it is time to leave home and go into the icy wilderness to make their own family, as baby yetis would do normally. Based on previous attempts at domestication, there seems to be a 30% chance that the two-year-old yeti will actually instead stay with the human master. If that happens, you will have a very loyal and less ferocious yeti who will stay with you forever. Furthermore, an incredibly powerful monster that will protect you with its life. It's good too that domesticated yetis are less ferocious because wild ones are unapologetically aggressive. If you ever meet a wild yeti, it doesn't matter what you do, it'll always end up in combat. There's typically no checks that you can make or any knowledge that you can have that will prevent the beast from fighting you. They might not want to fight to the death, but they will fight you in an attempt to ward you off. Quote, they beat on their chests, hurl stones, strut about, flail their arms, and hoot loudly in a matter which echoes for great distances. If the intruders do not leave, they are soon surrounded and attacked. If they do leave, they are stalked and attacked soon enough. Any meeting with these creatures is bound to lead to conflict. End quote. That's one thing that you have to remember too about yetis. Like I described them before, they are basically apes, so they do beat on their chests like gorillas do. You should also know that you can actually extract a form of oil from a yeti, oil that is actually considered a poison. Injecting yeti oil will make you sluggish and slow. I would like to personally thank my patron supporters Walker Motley, Zach Bowell, Rocato Fan, Barry Mascant, 5E Magic Shop, Daniel Umar, Rusty Rain, Morgan Johnson, Biotechnofrag, Daniel Luna, Doc Feeder, Terry Culp, Barakis Law, Omega Scales, Karathas de Bulwark, Ozol, Soundtech, Ziri, Alex Cookson, Square Chicken, Ariel Nelson, Benjamin Bosters, IO is Awesome, Falky951, Jacob Krazed, Griffin Pierce, Xeron King, Brad Salazar, Sabine Kurjab, Solarensis, Ordoric, Tesla Coil, Michael S, Prince Daylight Morning Crown, William Sladen, Drayden, Troll Skull Dude, Mr. Salty, Adam A, Silent Choppa, The Role Playing Junkies Podcast, Thomas Hunt, and Jericho Darkstar for supporting me on Patreon at the $25 level. If you would like to support me as well, then please head on over to patreon.com slash Rex to support. Guys, thank you very, very much for watching. I would like to just make the announcement that next video we're going to be doing Tiamat. So if you guys have any art for Tiamat that you've made before or that you want to make, then you can send that art over into the email that I have put in the description. Uh, just let me know. Just let me know what name you want me to use as far as the attribution of the art is concerned but yeah send me whatever art you want me to use uh some of the art that you saw in this video were sent by you guys using the email so you know make sure you get in on that if, if you want to see your own art in in this uh in this series i also would like to thank my patron supporters uh basically every single one of you for supporting me uh youtube has been kind of rough i've mentioned this before in the past uh couple of weeks that 
since Corona kind of hit, the videos aren't really worth that much or as much as they used to. Um, a, at a certain point, they were worth just about maybe less than half of what they used to be worth. So things are kind of rough uh, on, on YouTube as far as advertising is concerned. So just I just want to say thank you to every single one of you who like and comment the videos. And of course, a special thanks to those of you who support me on Patreon. I truly appreciate it. For our next video, uh, we're going to be doing a sponsorship. Um, it, it really would mean a lot to me if you guys would help me out with that sponsorship of course i don't want to talk about it yet uh before we kind of seal uh how is it going to be but uh you will see it on the next video so if if you guys really want to support the channel then please i beg of you uh just go ahead and help me out there when it happens it, it, it would mean a lot to me and of course it would help out with the channel a lot i'll be doing a a free extra video after that if we kind of do well with the uh with the sponsorship just as a, as a thank you for all of you. But that's it. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.